all God is doing in our own personal lives. But we're coming here especially on behalf of those who are unable to be here today. I know you believe that God answers prayer. You, you wouldn't be here today if you know that God answers prayer. I'm looking at a few people that know that God answers prayer. Sister Thomason, she knows it. Brother Jameson, he knows it. Sister Pepper, she knows it. Brother McCullough, he knows it. It don't, it don't just take sickness to help you to understand that God answers prayer. Sometimes you can really be in trouble. I don't hear nobody saying amen. And you had to pray, Lord, save me. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? I'm telling on myself, now, I've been in trouble before. And, uh, and nobody can help me but Jesus. This is the time you share those names with us. You know those are the high prayers. Yes, ma'am. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. This is a day you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for coming to see about us. Thank you for providing for us. But most of all, God, thank you for forgiving us. You have looked beyond our faults, seen every one of our needs. God, you've been there for us when we could not be there for ourselves. You watched over us when we could not watch over ourselves. We thank you today, God, for being who you are. It's because of who you are that we give you glory. Because of who you are that we give you praise. It's because of who you are that we lift our voices and our hands and our hearts to the hills where our help comes from. Because all our help comes from you. Be with the Mount Emmanuel Missionary Baptist Church. Be with our leadership, our membership, and be with this community. We understand that we, being on one accord right now is of most importance. We may not always understand, but the songwriter said we'll understand it better by and by. As the scripture says, God, teach us to number our days. That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Send your Holy Ghost power here to this place. That we will be filled with your love, with your life. And the lessons that you have sent us through many prophets and preachers to learn about your word. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our Lord and Savior. Thank you for this day. For it's a day we've never seen before. So those of us who have woken up this morning without pausing, we want to say right now, thank you. Through danger seen and unseen, on the highways of life, you kept us safe from accidents and incidents, from hurt, harm, and danger. Thank you, God, for healing our body and helping us to run on. If it had not been for you who was on our side, tell us where would we be. Thank you, God. You just need to hear it because we mean it. Sometimes we forget to say it, but here today we mean it. Thank you, God. We don't deserve what you've given us. We don't deserve your blessings. Thank you, God. And we say today that you are God. You are good. And you're gracious to us. Answer our prayer, not because we're good, but because you're good. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say together, amen. Let's make sure tell everything's gonna be all right. It's rich.
lesson for this morning is found in John's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. We're read. You found it, say amen. Read from the New Revised Standard Version. This is at verse 15 in chapter 21 of John's Gospels. It says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten the belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this in, to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Look at someone next to you and say to them, strive to be the best. Amen. You may be seated. Strive to be the best. Every Christian must be motivated for ministry by our love of Jesus Christ. It's good to have people come to church because of their history and their tradition to that particular church that they attend. It's good to have people come to church because of their relationship with the person that invited them to church. It's good to have people come to church to experience some type of ministry. But the best commitment that we could ever offer to the gospel is our love for Jesus. It's good to do things because somebody asked you, but it's best to do it because of your love for the Lord. Amen. Love is defined as a strong attraction brought about by affection or desire, an object of affection or desire to have an affection or desire for. In other words, when you have love in a relationship, the desire to maintain that relationship in a healthy way is of a great priority. It is a high priority in your mind. And when you love someone, uh, or when you are loved by someone, uh, you want the, them to have the best. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, for example, when we love our children, we don't give our children scraps if we can help it. We want to make sure that our children have the best food. When we love our girlfriend or our boyfriend, we don't take them to McDonald's when we really want to impress them. Somebody say amen. And when we love our husband or our wife, we want to make sure that we put our best efforts into giving them the best of our love because our desire, our affection for them is of a high importance. Christians often misunderstand the difference between human love and divine love. Human love is often selfish. It's based on a quid pro quo system. In order for you to give to them, you first have to receive from them. And so we have holidays that we have secularized based on our feeble understanding of human love, like Valentine's Day, like Mother's Day, 
like Christmas or, or any other secular holiday where we give to the person because they have given something to us. And that's not the way that it works with God because we did not love God first. The hymn writer had it written correctly when it said, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Divine love is different than human love because human love is limited to emotions and personal relationships. When you have a human love for somebody, you can love them today and not like them on today. You can feel good about them today and not so good about them on tomorrow. I have been both the recipient of human love and divine love. My family loves me. My friends love me. But I, I cannot guarantee in my own mind that that love that they have for me will always be there because one day I might have to disappoint them. One day I might have to let them down. One day I might discourage them or disagree with them and God is not like that with us. When we disappoint him, it hurts him, but he does not take his love away from us. When we disagree with him, it makes him feel like he's not being accepted but he does not turn his back on us. When we turn our backs on God, he always has his arms stretched out wide, saying, I never leave you, nor forsake you. Divine love is potent in quantity and excellent in quality. It's a five-star love, and it never closes. It's open 24-7, 365 days of the year. There's enough for it to last, and it'll never run out. And it's of the highest quality that you will never need to complain. You can complain about my love, because my love may not measure up to to your expectations but God's love will exceed your expectations his love will exceed your expectations and quality so much that you will go out and tell somebody he's the best I've ever had he's been the best thing that's ever happened to me divine love never falls short of my needs God wants us as a church to strive to be loving disciples of Jesus the Christ. Christian discipleship is not about just getting by our daily experiences and circumstances. You know, we have a lot of folk in the church that got that going through theology. Every time you see them, they're always talking about what they're going through. Their life and their mind is fixated on their circumstance and not on the love that they have for God. It's not about living in the moment. It's about living out a loving relationship with God through Jesus Christ. See, I don't know if I'm preaching to folk that have ever been in love. When you are really, really in love, all you talk about is the love of your life. Your friends get tired of seeing you because they know you're going to bring up that person that you're in love with. You're blogging about them on Facebook. You put little kissy face pictures up. You're writing their name where you should be writing down notes in class because they're always on your mind. But I really question if some believers, so-called believers, really love the Lord because as soon as trouble comes in their life, the focus goes on the trouble and not on their love for God. But I love the Lord. As the hymn writer said, he heard my cry and pitied every groan. Long as I live while trouble rise, I'll hasten to his throne. However, we often take our relationship with God for granted. We tend to expect to receive more from God than we're willing to give to God. We many times go to God with our hands stretched out instead of our hands lifted up. We have an attitude of pity that we expect God to have towards us instead of an attitude of prayer. I praise God because I love God. Not always because I feel like I deserve something from God. Because many times I realize 
eyes in my selfish manner, in my selfish agenda, in my self-righteous agenda at times. I think that God should give to me because I'm good. But the reality is, is God shouldn't give to me not because I'm good. God gives to me because he's good, because he loves us so very much. Nobody's shouting yet. Maybe you're waiting to hear your cue uh, or your special line about what you're going to get to God uh, or get from God. Uh, but how many came today to give something to God? Uh, giving God a praise. Uh, giving God a thank you uh, because you love him so much. Christ brings new meaning to love and to living. However, we often take our relationship with God for granted. We tend to expect to receive more from God than we're willing to give. John 21 records another post-resurrection account of Jesus appearing to his disciples. On this particular account in chapter 21, Jesus appeared to 10 of his disciples as they were out there on the waters fishing. Luke puts the story at the beginning of the gospel in chapter 5 where seemingly these fishermen led by Peter, James, and John uh, were having an unsuccessful day uh, at the office. Uh, anybody out there ever had a bad day at work? Uh, anybody out there ever had a day where you wish uh, that 12 o'clock would turn into 5 o'clock uh, at the blink of an eye? Uh, anybody ever had a day where you wanted to go ahead and turn in your, your resignation uh, and ask for your pink slip? Uh, you tell them uh, that they can take this job uh, and shove it like the song says. Uh, well, the Bible was says that on this particular occasion, instead of at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, it's after he had risen from the grave that he finds his closest followers, his disciples in whom he had already appeared to some weeks before in the upper room with the doors locked. And he came in and said, peace be unto you. And they had told Thomas, who was not there on the first time, that we have seen the Lord. And Thomas said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and the prints my hand in the womb in his side, I will not believe. Jesus came back eight days later and appeared unto the disciples again and said, it is I. He said to Thomas, see the nails in my hands. See the wound in my side. Put your hand in it. And because you've seen me, you believe. But blessed are those that believe and have not seen. So they had seen the Lord when they went back to fishing. And that's how it is with some of us. We've been in the presence of God. We've seen God work in our lives. But we go back sometimes to doing what we was doing before we met Jesus. Nobody's shouting right there. Because you in church. But church may not be in you. Because if church is really in you, you'll be too thankful and too grateful to go back to the same old ways. The text leads us to suggest that Peter wasn't that good a fisherman. Because when we find Peter in Luke 5, he hadn't caught nothing. And we find Peter in John 21, he still hadn't caught anything. But when he recognized that it was Jesus, in this particular text, he swims out to him. And he swims, as the Bible suggests, some 100 yards out to Jesus. And he is glad to see his Savior. He swims 100 yards with no clothes on, y'all. After a bad days of work, God still performing a miracle in his life. Helping him catch more fish than he ever had caught before. But he had more work for him to do. And what I'm saying to you is, is that Peter swam out to Jesus, not because of the miracle that was performed, but because of his love for the Lord. The most important aspect of ministry is our love for Jesus Christ. This particular appearance emphasized the importance of love 
discipleship and ministry. For all ministry flows through our love. Peter, the fisherman, was also to be a shepherd and care for both lambs and sheep. In order to show our love for Christ, we must have a hearty appetite for God's word and a healthy attitude about ministry. Ain't nobody shouting right there. Because when we come to church at many times, we're not thinking about ministering to someone else. Many people, you can listen to what they say when they're looking for a church. They're looking for something that's going to minister to them. But what God wants us as disciples to understand, if you minister to God, he'll minister back to you. If you serve God with a whole heart, with a hearty appetite for his word, and a healthy attitude about ministry, you can get to a place where you can look at people and smile and say, you ain't got to give me nothing. Because God got to fly all my need. About his running, their song is not being sung, but we're gonna go ahead and say uh, that it's about your love for Jesus. We must have a hearty appetite for God's word uh, and a healthy attitude of excellence about ministry. We must strive to be the best disciples uh, that we can possibly be. Uh, our utmost priority uh, ought to be to please the Lord uh, and live by faith. Uh, to have a five-star ministry, uh, it takes uh, an attitude of excellence and it takes an appetite for his word God gave us his best through Jesus Christ and we must give our best back to God strive to be the best look at your neighbor and say strive to be the best I know you're out there hearing and wondering how do we give our best to God this answer is in our text today. Look at the text as it teaches us three lessons that we can take home with us in order to be our best in our service for the kingdom. The first lesson that we have is, is we answer the call to discipleship. Look at your neighbors to answer the call. Look at verse number 15. Jesus is having breakfast with his disciples. As he is often seen in the gospels, he's teaching and manifesting his word and his ministry to his disciples by way of having a meal. He appears to them and has a meal in his post-resurrection body, in his glorified body, and even in his glorified body, y'all, he still has an appetite. Jesus still gets hungry, y'all, which lets us know who a Holy Ghost filled and sanctified that we ought to still have an appetite after we've been touched by God. We ought to have a desire for more, a desire for better. And the Bible says they brought some fish and they gave it to him and he ate it. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus finished wiping his mouth and he brushed off his hands and he leaned over to Peter, his favorite disciple, and he asked him a very important question. He said, Simon, Simon, do you love me? And I don't know how the folk out there got family and got friends and got loved ones. And every now and again, you just want to check in with them and ask them that important question. You say, son, do you love me? Wife, do you love me? Sister, do you love me? Husband, do you love me? Not that you're really questioning their love. Look at your neighbor say you're just checking in. Jesus is checking in with Peter and he asked him if he's really a disciple. He says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. The word yes in the Greek comes to the word nigh, which means indeed or certainly. There used to be a song we used to sing in the church, have you got good religion? It says certainly, Lord. Peter was asked by Jesus, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord. I know you know that I love you. And my brothers and sisters, Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And what it suggests to us, 
through these exchange of conversation between Jesus and Peter is love is more than an idea. It's an action. And look at your neighbor and say, actions speak louder than the words. Look at the text. It says he has to answer the call to discipleship. How many of you got a yes in your soul? How many of you got a yes in your spirit? How many of you are really listening for the love of God to call upon you so that your heart is mine, is ready to say yes? I'm so glad that the church of God in Christ has that song that teaches us that we need to say yes, Lord. Completely yes. Our soul needs to say yes. Look at your neighbor and say, answer the call. Many people have call an ID when it comes to God. When God is calling, we're looking the saying that we know that it's God calling us, but we're not prepared to answer God's call because we're still doing what we want to do. We're still excited about going back to our old ways. And Peter had been caught in the act of backsliding, y'all. He had went back to fishing when he called him from fishes of fish to be fishers of men. Peter had already seen Jesus. He had already experienced the risen Jesus. But he went back and Jesus needed to check in to see if his love was for real. He said, answer the call, Peter. Do you love me more than these? See, a lot of us are comfortable of hanging around with the disciples because we know that the disciples have fear just like we have fear. The disciples are human just like we human. The disciples, when they're ready to take a drink, they won't mind us taking a drink. When the disciples are sliding by the club, they'll know that we won't mind sliding by the club. But when we're serving God, we're not serving the disciples first. We're serving Jesus first. If Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than the disciples? Some of you are scared to leave your friends. Because if you leave your friends, you won't know how to act. Because you always got to check in with them to make sure you dress right, to make sure your hair looks right, to make sure that you're singing right. We always got to check in with folks. But when are we going to check? Check in with Jesus. Look at your neighbor say, answer the call. Second thing that we see in the text is not only do we answer the call to discipleship, we accept the challenges of discipleship. Look at your neighbor say, it's a challenge. Amen, somebody. A second time he said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt, y'all. The Bible says he was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And that suggests to us is, is that in ministry, in discipleship, Every now and again, somebody's going to hurt your feelings. I got good news for you. You need to get out of this mindset and this cliche talk about church hurts. Because the Bible ain't never talked about no church hurts. I know you watch TV in. I know you watch Word Network. And folk got all these catchy terms. But ain't no way you going to find the word church hurt in the Bible. Look at your neighbor and say, it's just hurt. It's when you're going to get hurt when you're serving God. And sometimes God's going to hurt your feelings. Look at your neighbor say it's a challenge. The word grieved in the Greek is lupeo, which means state of sadness. Cause someone to be sad, sorrowful, or distressed. See, what Jesus is doing is he's taking his time to teach Peter a valuable lesson. A couple of weeks before, Peter had said that he would die for Jesus, that he would go all the way to the cross for Jesus, and that he would never let anything happen to Jesus. 
Jesus. And P Jesus said to Peter, before the cock crows, you have denied me three times. Peter denied Jesus three times. So he had to ask him three times, did he love him? Peter was by a fire when he had denied Jesus. And they were by a fire again when he said that he loved him. About three times had Peter been shamed by God. And now about three times had Peter been restored by God. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to see God work miracles in your life. And you get around people who don't even believe God exists. They got frowns on their faces. They talking about problems and challenges in their life. But I'm so glad that when the devil brings challenges my way, I can wave my hands and say, get out of my way. Because I'm ready for what God has for me. I can see God stretching out in my life. But I can see him stretching out in others. Look at your neighbor and say, get glad. Some of us have heard the scripture wrong. They said I was bad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Some people say I was bad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And some folks even say I was sad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Well, you don't need to be bad today. You don't need to be sad today. You don't need to be bad today. Look at them and say, you ought to be glad. You got to answer the call to discipleship. You got to accept the challenges of discipleship. But thirdly and lastly, you got to appreciate the invitation to discipleship. Look, they say you got to appreciate the invitation. It's amazing to me how some of us are wallflowers of the faith. We're just like the ugly girls at the prom, the ugly boys at the prom. We stand on the wall all night complaining about nobody will ask us to dance. And then when somebody finally gets the nerve to ask us to dance, we want to get pretty. We want to get an attitude and think that we are all that and a bag of chips. But all the time, nobody don't always want to dance with you. But if they ask you to dance, at least you are to do is say thank you. And I'm so glad that he had me in mind. I'm so glad that he had Peter in mind. I'm so glad that I ain't got to be perfect in order for God to tell me these two simple words. In verse 19, it says he said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. I mean, are you glad that you got to be a follower of Jesus? I feel all right today because I'm going to follow him no matter who doesn't come to church or who comes to church. I will follow him all the way from the earth to the cross, from the cross to the grave, and the grave to the sky. I love the Lord, and I'm going to lift his name on high. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? He was talking about the other disciples in order to challenge Peter. Look, the neighbor say, I'm challenging you. He challenges Peter's understanding of true love. On two different occasions, Peter had claimed to have extraordinary love for Jesus, comparing himself to the other disciples. Jesus told him the first time to be his lambs. The second time he told him to tend to his sheep. Peter was an average fisherman. He wasn't that good of a fisherman. He was just an average fisherman. But he was challenged to be an even better shepherd than he was a fisherman. He had to care for people. He had to love people. 
people from every walk of life, from prostitutes to tax collectors to harlots to poor and whoremongers. He had to care about people from every walk of life. Peter denied Jesus three times, but he had to say he loved them three times. And I got one question for you. Is your love for God for real? If it's real, you ought to stand on your feet and say, Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. How many out there know him? Do you know him? Will you say yeah? Say Love the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus.